Hello, Misfit Entrepreneurs. This is Dave Lucas, and welcome to another episode of The Misfit Entrepreneur, where it's our job to help you unleash your inner misfit and break through to higher levels of success, wealth, and fulfillment by bringing you the best insight and information from the world's top entrepreneurs with a specific focus on their misfit side, the specific traits, habits, and secrets that have allowed them to thrive and succeed. As a reminder, if you're new to watching us on our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button below. Give this video a like and comment as well. We do our best to respond to all comments comments as timely as possible. This week's Misfit Entrepreneur is Rupal Patel. Rupal's career has taken her from CIA, CIA officer in the military with briefing rooms in jungles and war zones to becoming a serial entrepreneur in corporate boardrooms and international stages. She took her CIA experience and for over a decade has been building businesses and providing mentorship as a consultant and advisor to founders and leaders throughout the world. Her latest book is called From CIA to CEO, Unconventional Life Lessons for Thinking Bigger, Leading Better, and Being Boulder. And she shares the lessons, the tactics, the strategies for success in life and entrepreneurship. I can't wait to dig into all of her experience and you know what she's done and, and what she's seen that she can talk about, um, lessons learned, and to get her best advice on how to succeed as an entrepreneur. So let's jump in. Rupal, are you ready to unleash your inner misfit? Let's do it. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, yes, very interesting career, right? So from CIA and in war zones and everything to CEO and and number of businesses and everything. Why don't you just take five minutes or so and just tell us how did you get to where you're at? Tell us your story. Yeah. So I think it's perfect that we're having this conversation uh, on a misfit podcast, because for me, <laughs> that has been a recurring theme in my life. I come from a very high performance uh, family and in which, you know, we were all expected to become doctors, lawyers, uh, bankers, et cetera. And I was the misfit in my family. I did not become a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. Uh, my siblings did, and they're amazing and, you know, did inc do incredibly well for themselves, but I never really fit a, a mold. And um, what I think that was really helpful in allowing me to do was to be a bit more open and exploratory in how I pursued my career and enabled me just the freedom, I think, to try things to, I love what's behind your desk every day is a new adventure, because that's one of my <laughs> mottos is to sort of uh, say yes to adventure. And that is how I ended up at the CIA. I, you know, I, you know, I went to good universities. I studied political science. I uh, really love to learn. And, and when I was studying for my master's in international affairs, the CIA invited me to apply. And I immediately said yes, because this was, again, not a plan uh, or not something that I had even thought was a possibility for me, but it was a really intriguing invitation. And so I thought, you know what? Yes, this sounds like an incredible potential adventure. Let me learn more about what it would look like and how it would be to actually work in a place like that. And the more I found out, the more I felt like this was going to be a perfect career choice for me. So it happened not by some grand design. It happened, I think, you know, of course, I, I had the background that they were looking for, you know, having lived and worked overseas, having sp sp speaking multiple languages, having a facility and understanding different cultures and that kind of thing. But uh, it was because I was open to it that I had that ability and that freedom to say yes, as opposed to feeling like, nope, nope, I'm going to go follow this very structured path. Um, so that's how it happened. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, yeah, the, the CIA usually identifies a candidate ahead of them even applying to work there. Like you said, you were invited to apply and it's because of special skill sets or things that catches their eye. And you just kind of mentioned some of that. Talk a little bit about the background. So uh, you mentioned you lived overseas, you have multiple languages. Tell, tell us a little bit more about that background. Is that from growing up? Was Were you back and forth from like the States and in other areas? So it is from growing up, but perhaps not in the obvious way. So, um, yeah, so I come from an immigrant family. And so growing up, we were uh, bilingual in my household. My parents are from India. We, me and my siblings were all born and raised in New York. But we spoke both uh, Gujarati, which is an Indian language, as well as English at home because my grandparents lived with us and we often had you know visitors coming. So I was already bilingual from a young age, but something in me just loved learning languages. So even in school, um, I, I, I learned Spanish and and took it up until high school. But because I loved practicing and speaking different languages so much, 
any opportunity I got outside of school, I was using mm. my Spanish. And in New York, you have many, many opportunities to do so. And that yeah. it's funny because I have not ever formally trained in the language since. But now, you know, I'm in my 40s now. Last Spanish class I took was when I was, you know, 16, 17. About 30 years later, so much of that is still with me because I've practiced it and people are often really surprised and impressed that I didn't learn it past high school because um, I'm pretty decently fluent at it. And I think this passion and curiosity about the Mm -hmm. world um, fueled some of the choices I made around when I was an undergrad I uh, did the State Department internship, and so I was working at the U.S. Embassy in Muscat, Oman for a summer. I spent a summer in Costa Rica working at an organic Mm. farm and just was trying to look for opportunities to live overseas, to live a different type of life, to learn about different countries, different cultures. And that has always been a part of who I am and something that I enjoy doing. So it was great to find a place like the CIA where you are also valued for that experience and that interest. Sure. Sure. Interesting. So then what made you transition out of the CIA to entrepreneurship? It's a really bizarre answer and perhaps not one that anyone would expect. It was, so I was at the agency from my early twenties to my early thirties. And as I was approaching 30, it felt like it was like this big milestone, this big, oh my God, I'm going to plummet off of a cliff after this. Right. And I had this crazy notion that if I did, if I wanted to ever explore anything outside of the CIA, if I didn't do it soon, I would be considered too old to be marketable in in an outside context, which of course we all know is total nonsense, right? But at the time, it felt really real, and so there was nothing pushing me out, there was nothing pulling me out, there was nothing that I was desperate to do outside of the agency. It was more just a like, hey, if you're gonna, if you're ever gonna leave, now's the best time to do it, and just see what else is out there. And if if you don't like what you see out there, you can always come back. But if you do enjoy it, then at least you know you've given yourself the best Mm. chance. So that was literally sort of what what started that internal conversation around, should I stay or should I go? And then the only thing that I did know that I wanted to do was to live in London and find a way to do that. So that's where all of my efforts focused when I was deciding, okay, well, when I leave, what am I going to do? And business school seemed like a great way of making that transition out. So when I got accepted into uh, London Business School, I I handed in my uh, resignation and I moved to London 13 years ago now. Nice. You know, one of the things that struck me when we first um, met and we first, you know, uh, talked ahead of this interview was your um, your focus on uh, training your mind and the mindset uh, Mm -hmm. and not only for success, but to succeed in life and take on the challenges that that come with you. And this is a subject that's near and and dear to me as well, as as we discussed. what did you learn at the CAA about how to uh, improve your mind, take control over your mind that you feel has helped you most as an entrepreneur? I think it was two main things. One is uh, humility, which may surprise some people, but when you are operating in these really highly volatile, highly changeable contexts and environments, the one thing you very, very quickly realize is how much is outside of your control. And that instead of despairing over it and you know pulling out your hair, you then instead focus on the things you can control and just develop that agility to, to navigate that uncertainty and navigate that unpredictability. And of course, all of you know the people in your audience who have experience in being entrepreneurs, that is exactly the definition of, of entrepreneurship, right? It's being able to operate and thrive in uncertainty under changing conditions, unpredictability, all of that stuff. And so that humility of knowing the difference between the things I can control and the things I can't. And then instead of agonizing Mm. over all the things I can't, you know, controlling the controllables, that was a huge fundamental insight from, from my time at the agency. And then the other thing and related to this is a sense of just indomitability. Not that it's, you know, I'm indestructible, but there was a real, really sort of powerful energy around this idea of that, like, we can do anything. We've got great people, great minds, great resources. You know, we literally anything is possible. And we will be the ones who decide when we're going to give up, if we're going to give up, or if we're going to keep going in the face of everything, you know, that changes around us. So those two things, you know, in very extreme contexts, I saw, I experienced, I lived, and those are infinitely valuable in a commercial context, uh, you know, that, that combination of humility and resilience. Mm-hmm. 
And so how do you, how do you coach people to apply like those and, and other strategies around this stuff? Because I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges for people is, uh, is consistency with their, uh, their mindset and controlling their mind. One of the things we see with high performers all the time is, is they, they, they've developed habits and things that, that keep themselves at the top of their game with their mind, because we all have, we all have negative thoughts. We all have debilitating beliefs that can come up. It's, it's how we deal with them on a consistent basis that helps us in our success and in improving ourselves. Right. So, um, what are some of the things that, that you've learned and that you train others on to, uh, be at the top of their game? One of the biggest tools that I've developed and now coach others with is this idea of tactical ignorance. And the idea there is about really carefully curating sure. your inputs. So it's not about being ignorant and about, you know, burying your head in the sand. It's about that tactical element, about being very conscious and deliberate about what are you letting in and what are you keeping out? That's ideas, that's people, that's advice, that's inputs. And it's the atmospherics, it's all of that stuff. And then letting go of all, again, all of those things that you cannot control, you cannot sort of have any influence over. And instead of focusing on the things that you want to achieve and how you can then channel all of that energy that would have been wasted or diffused on the thing that you're trying to achieve. So a concrete example of this, you know, in a sports context is, you know, when you play basketball, if you're taking a free throw, you have to learn how to tune out, right? To tactically ignore the booing, the cheering, all of the noise in the stadium. And the same is true in, you know, in boardroom contexts. I had to do this when I was in an active war zone, having to brief a four-star general. I had to tune out all of that noise around the hierarchy and who's who, and this person is so important and I'm so junior, and instead tune that out and focus on delivering the best briefing to that general as I possibly could. So it has a tangible physical application, but it is a real mental toolkit around curating those inputs to enable you to perform at your best. And as I said, that's everything from the people you surround yourself with to the ideas that you're letting into the literal and uh, theoretical sort of noise that you're letting in or keeping out. So how does somebody uh, start to do this for themselves like a day to day? Like where does it start mm. for, for you? Yeah, I think for the, it's a, again, it's a very concrete process, but fundamentally it's about, first of all, looking at what those inputs are, right? So for example, if you are starting a business, or if you're, I'll, I'll use that as the example, you know, who, whose inputs are you letting in? Whose advice are you seeking? What podcasts are you listening to? What books are you reading? And then doing yeah. a very, uh, a very objective analysis of, is this helping move me forward or is this holding me back? One of the key things that we can do, again, very tangibly is looking at the people that we are surrounding ourselves with and how much of our time we are spending with those mm -hmm. people. Because, you know, we will have, many of us will have heard that, that phrase, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That is a real scientifically proven uh, sort of thing, right? Where you're the average of and wealth and health and health and activities, what you do with your free time, et cetera, of those people. So make sure those five people that you're spending the most time with are on the same page, share your values, or, you know, share those sort of ambition and drive, because if they don't, they will be pulling you back. And I have done this exercise at every stage of my career, even now, when I'm growing, when I'm shifting, when I'm doing something new, I make sure that I am re-curating those inputs to enable me to move forward in the direction that I want to go instead of, you know, staying stuck as where I am. And, so that's external, obviously, and, you know, making sure that you're choosing the external influences that you're bringing into your life and yep. what you allow to affect you or, you know, bring, bring to, towards you. What, what yep. about internal? So what are some things that you found internally that, uh, you can do on a daily basis to strengthen your mind and build that, uh, stronger mindset for yourself? So I'm all about objective data whenever possible and collecting data to integrate some of the assumptions, to integrate some of that internal, those internal blockers we have. So many people have these ideas, oh, well, it'll never work for me, or I, I suck at this, or I'm not good at this, or, you know, who am I to think I can do this, or I'm too old, or whatever that uh, dialogue or that conversation looks like. And what I like to, again, for myself and for others that I, I work with on this in particular, okay, well, give me the facts, right? Fine. You think that 
you are not qualified to start a business in, I don't know, fintech, right? Show me the data. Show me everything that proves this is true. And then show me the, the counterbalancing information that proves that it's not true. Because we all do cherry pick the data to the information or the things that we remember And it only focus on the negative, especially when it comes to ourselves, right? Us evaluating ourselves. So making it an objective exercise, prove it to me, right? Mm -hmm. If you think this this is true about yourself, show me the proof. And just by forcing you to yourself to take yourself out of your head and put it on paper can really help you see where, okay, well, this is where it is true. And can I do something about it to change it? And this is actually where it's not true. And I actually, I've been sort of holding myself back with all of these assumptions without realizing that there's a lot to show me, a lot of actual lived experience to prove to me that I can do this thing, or I have done something similar that will, will enable me to thrive in this new context. That's a really great point. And, and, and I was hoping we'd get to this because it, it does, it comes down to choice. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that they're, you know, they're conditioning out their lives. Uh, you guys in the CIA mm-hmm. understand conditioning really, really well, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the conditioning that they've gotten throughout their lives from all these influences has yeah. shaped their re reactions to things, their responses to mm-hmm. situations. Um, you know, most people don't think to do a lot of the things they do, right. It just automatically happens. Well, where do those yep those responses or those reactions come from? Well, they come from the condition that you've gotten ever since you came out of the womb, essentially. And mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff you can pick up is good, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, you can also pick up things that may be debilitating or holding you back yep. uh, and limiting you in a lot of ways too. Yep. And so once you recognize those things, um, and awareness is the catalyst to change, but once you recognize those things, you, you, you can ask that question, is this something I chose to think or have in my life, yeah. right? Or not. And you decide, yes, either I keep that or no, I want to change it to this. And this is the thought pattern that I'm going to have, or this is when this scenario comes up, this is how I'm going to wreck. This is how I'm going to respond going forward. Yep. That's where everything begins to change because it's a choice, right? And that's when you start to live from true choice and, and really take back your, your personal power from this programming and this conditioning that you've got in your whole life that you don't even, most people don't even realize they've had. Okay. So Rupal, your book is about unconventional lessons for uh, thinking bigger, leading better, as you said, and being bolder. So share some of those lessons with us. Yeah. So I think fundamentally for me, again, and, and you touched on it in our in your last sort of comment, is that self-analysis, that awareness of, well, how did I get to this point? Um, not just sort of physically, but mentally, right? What What is the baggage that I'm carrying? What is that conditioning? And unpacking all of that, because until you go through that first very fundamental uh, sort of exercise, everything else will become a lot easier, but you have to do that work. And so the first third of my book is really about understanding how you operate, what you know, you know, what your personality type is writ large, what are the things that you respond to, what are the contexts very concretely in which you thrive, where are those contexts that you do less well, and being very, very tangible and concrete about it. So the book is very action oriented. There is a lot of, there are a lot of exercises, there are templates and downloads and things so you can really sort of you know, get your hands dirty with these concepts because that's where it all builds from. And so once you've established this understanding, okay, well, this is how I tick, right? This is how I operate, not just leaving anything for granted and and taking it as assumed. These are my instincts and this is how I can now describe them. You can then use that place of awareness and knowledge to build, okay, well, where do I want to go? This is where, where I am now. This is what I'm equipped with mentally, practically, all of those things. And this is the vision for where I want to go, or this is where I think I might want to go. And then a lot of the book then talks about different hmm. experiments. So there's one sort of self-awareness tool that I refer to as a personal energy map. And this is about identifying your energy ebbs and flows for different types of activities, you know, strategic, creative, administrative, whatever it looks like, so that you can then start to, when possible, align what you're doing in your day to day with where your energy is naturally flowing and be in that flow state more often than not. You know, not all or nothing, not deciding, okay, well, everybody has to conform to this new pattern of of the way I'm going to operate, but having that awareness so that you can eliminate the friction from the day to day when possible. So, the personal energy map is one of the the biggest tools and I think one of the most powerful tools in the book. And then, you know, it builds on from there. 
Yeah. So, uh, and that, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I think, um, uh, to me, like if you don't know yourself and, and you don't actually take the time to, to, un, to say, okay, who am I? What do I believe? Right. What are the mm-hmm. principles that I stand for and stand upon? If you don't do that, you don't have a, you don't have a, it's very hard to, to grow and move forward because you've got, you've got no center you know, in that sense. And so yeah. I, I think stating that is, is really important because most people never take the time to do that. Most never people never mm-hmm. sit down for like on a Friday afternoon and just like ask the question, like, who mm-hmm. am I? What do I stand mm-hmm. for? What do I truly mm-hmm. want? What do I truly mm-hmm. believe? What matters? Like, and, and really like defining that for themselves and creating yes. kind of a North star, if you will. Right. So I love that you, you talk about that and that you lead them on that journey in that book, because that's where, once you know that it, things fall into place so much easier. Right. And it's and so it, much easier it, to, to move forward. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and it just makes decisions that much easier as well, because, you know, so often what I hear people Mm. say is like, oh, I feel really stuck right now, or I don't know which direction to go, or, you know, I have this choice that I'm considering, and, and how do I assess which is the right thing for me? Well, you can't know that until you do all of that, those things that you and I have just been talking about, understanding your values, understanding your North Star, understanding, right. you know, the, the things that are important to you and unique to you. And so once you, the work is front loaded, right? Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lot to do. But once you do that, it makes everything else so much easier and so much less painstaking because then it takes away all of the agony of like, oh, well, I'm in this scenario, maybe I should do this or in that scenario. No, you have this now core fundamental mm-hmm. understanding of who you are and what's important to you. You use that instead of this ad hoc approach to then help you make all of the big life decisions from both personal and a professional perspective. So yeah, I would say if anything, don't rush through that part because that is the key to everything else <laughs> as you've, you know, you've rightly identified. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. Like that's the you know if you if you do well up front, it makes everything easier on the end, right? So um, so it, just a critical thing for for life in general. If you want to improve yourself, if you want to level up to to new levels, yes. um, you know you you mentioned it before, um, and you know it's uh, it, I'm curious too. You, you've worked with you know many top leaders, including four star mm-hmm. generals, right? So what are traits? of some of the best leaders that you found and what are some leadership lessons that you learned working with these individuals? It's become a bit of a buzzword now, but the reality is it's authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I will say there are some very, very vivid examples from my time at the CIA and then outside of the CIA, you know, a four star general, my chief of station when I was serving um, in a war zone overseas. And then uh, one of my uh, former supervisors who was a Marine and then another supervisor who's now very, very senior at the agency. And what all of those people have in common and what all of the high performing leaders that I have worked with since then have in common is that they, again, tying back to what we've just said, they know who they are and they are not precious with their egos. They know this is their area of expertise and that everything else outside of that area of expertise is for them to then pull in the others who are the best, to ask good questions, to ask for insight, to ask for opinions with the acceptance that, yes, they have to make the final decision. They are the one sort of, the, you know, the, the buck stops with them, mm-hmm. but they're not going to pretend that they are all knowing, all seeing these like perfect beings. And that real authenticity of just being who they are, accepting, again, that that the the boundaries of their expertise and not conforming to a stereotype or conforming to an archetype of what a leader Mm. should be like. Because especially in these super high performance contexts, there's so much noise around, oh, Mm. well, you have to look a certain way. You have to behave a certain way. You have to be aggressive and loud and, Mm. you know, in your face and all of this stuff. And the reality is never that simple, right? The the best leaders, and you're smiling, so I see you appreciate this. Like the best leaders Mm -hmm. are not that, right? I don't know why Hollywood keep shoving that perception down our throats because they are, you know, the best leaders are who they are. They're authentic. They're natural. They might be a bit more internal. They might be a bit more introverted, a bit more collaborative. There's a whole spectrum of what good leadership looks like. And the best leaders acknowledge right. where they are in that spectrum and don't try to pretend to be otherwise. Yeah. 
You know, um, you mentioned something there as you were saying, you said it earlier and I want to come back to it because it, it, it reminds me of this too. It's a trait of leaders that I think it goes underlooked, but I think it's one of the most important traits for a great leader and that's decision-making and decisiveness. So Mm -hmm. talk to us about that crucial role that you see for decision-making, decisiveness and leaders, because as you talk about, you know, the best leaders, as you're saying and everything now, they're authentic to themselves. Mm -hmm. But, but I I would, I would venture to say that they're probably pretty good at decision-making and Mm -hmm. they're, when they make a decision, they stick with it and, you know, they own it and everything else. Right. So there's that personal responsibility aspect. So talk to us a little bit more about like some of the experiences, maybe if you've got a few examples of like decisions in the field that had to be made and you know yeah go ahead yeah so it's you said it perfectly it's that ownership and that taking of responsibility for whatever happens right you make a decision and then you accept the ramifications of that good and bad and what i loved about some of those Mm. uh, leaders that i worked with in the field for example one my chief of station was the one of the best examples of this where you know he would put his neck out on the line to give resources or assets or responsibilities to someone like me who is an outsider, right? From the, from in many ways, I'm a civilian, I'm, I'm a young analyst, et cetera. And he would say, you know what? She needs to, to, to do X, Y, and Z to fulfill the bigger mission. I don't care what the ranks are. I don't care who does or doesn't like this. I'm going to give you that, the, the, the tools, the resources, and empower you to do what you need to do to get your job done. And I will hold the umbrella when the proverbial hits the fan. Okay. And so I think that was, you know, a, a really mm-hmm. great example because there is so much politics in organizations. There is so much who's, you know, people are watching each other right. and who, who's, who's doing what with who and who's, you know, sort of, um, uh, getting these resources or this budget or that thing. And he was like, look, if you can make a, a, a mission specific case for why you need to do this and why it's important, then I will do what I can to help you regardless of the blowback from it. And and this, I mean, just sort of internal to the organization. And so I think it's that sort of leading by example, as far as not succumbing to all of the politics and not succumbing to all of the like, oh, well, you know, that person's too junior. So why did you give that thing to them? And, and, and that, right. yeah, that just sort of the really, um, uh, I would say like the uglier side, right. Of, of high performance cultures where everyone wants to like yeah. hog the glory and be the one with the gold star at the end of the day. I think really good leaders are good right. about, you know what, I'm going to do what's right as opposed to what's political. And that was one of the, the most vivid examples uh, mm. when I was op- when I was working in the field. Well, that's a great uh, point too. do what's right versus what's political, especially in today's age, because mm-hmm. I mean, there's that whole aspect of the political side, especially in government. Right. Overall. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's, you know, do you play the game? Do you not play the game? And how do you move up if you don't play the game and and all of that stuff? And it's, Mm -hmm. you know, you get the same thing in corporate bureaucracy and and, and stuff, too. And it's a it's a tough line to toe. Um, And and, and, uh, if you want to in a lot of cases, if you want to move up. Right. If you don't care about that so much, then it's not so so much of a big deal. But how. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you advise leaders to balance the need to, um, you know, I, I guess move up and be able to do so, but keep their keep their soul in doing so, you know, because <laughs> a lot of times people give it up so they can go higher, right? And I think yeah. this is for any you know for any entrepreneurs leading an organization too. It's about the culture you create around it, right? Because this does mm-hmm. exist. For sure. And I'm so glad you asked that because I actually think we can overcomplicate this. I think it goes back to that idea of personal accountability Mm -hmm. and owning your decision, right? You get to choose whatever context you're in. You get to choose how political you want to be, how much you want to play the game or how little you want to play the game, knowing what the full reality is, right? And then accept the repercussions of that, accept the personal uh, impact of it, accept the professional impact of it play the game for a little while, don't play it. But I think there is no single answer to this, right? This will be, I mean, I know what my answer is to this, but for individual leaders, you have to decide what 
feels right for you, what sits well with your sense of integrity, with your values, with all of that stuff we've been talking about up until now. And then if you go and do something in violation of those things, then you also have to accept what comes with that, the personal, mental toll, the stress, the whatever, you know, uh, you know, I won't presume to know how it impacts other people, but I think it's really, it, you don't have to make it this big agonizing thing of like, well, look, make the decision, but make it knowing what the trade-offs are that are involved, what it's going to require of you mm -hmm. to trade off both personally and professionally, if anything, and then decide how you want to play the game or choose to play a different game, right? I think that's the other thing. You don't have to stay in a context right. or in a, in a culture that is just not right for you because you will do it at great personal cost. So you can play the game and be sort of a bit of a martyr so you can get to the top and then change the culture as long as you don't uh, change who you are along the way, or you can choose it's just not right for you or you're not willing to, right. to make that even short term trade-off and then you leave. I, I don't think that there's there's no value judgment from my side anyway. It's you have to decide what you're willing to give up in order to do right. the things that you want to do. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I, again, it goes back to knowing who you are, staying true to yourself, right? And not sacrificing your principles and, and your values and stuff for who you are. But if you don't know what those are, yeah. then it's all over the place <laughs> and it's a lot easier, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Any other uh, pieces of advice, lessons learned from your time at the CEA as you've transitioned into entrepreneurship that you feel are important mm -hmm. for our audience to hear before we get to your Misfit 3? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's – and this is a, sort of a bigger picture um, uh, problem with, I think, the way society is. But don't be precious about being wrong. I think there's, especially as an entrepreneur, pretty much everything that you are doing, and even as a leader, actually, everything you're doing is a bit of an experiment, right? And some experiments are a little bit less risky, some are a bit more risky, but it's okay if you get things wrong. And it's okay to admit when you've gotten something wrong. And it's okay to admit that you're going to have to figure out a different way of doing this thing. And I think, you know, and part of what comes with that is having a willingness to engage with people who will give you constructive criticism because so many people, especially when they've reached a certain level of success or a certain level of wealth or a certain title, create these echo chambers around them that just tell them how amazing they are, how well things are going. And that's not going to help you improve. It's not going to help your business improve. It's not going to help you or your business grow. So be willing to be wrong and be willing to, and if anything, try to get as much constructive criticism and feedback from others um, in order to make sure that you don't ever uh, so that you stay sharp and that you're not ever sort of losing that ability mm. to learn, mm. to pivot, to evolve, because that's what the world requires of us, especially in business with how things are changing so quickly. You need to be mm. agile and you need to be able to adapt. And you cannot do that if you think that you know all the answers and that you're going to stick sort of blindly to a single to a single plan. Okay, it's time for Rupal's Misfit 3. These are the three things that she wants you to take that you could put in your life, your business, make a difference for yourself starting today. And the way that I always frame this to every guest that comes on the show is I say, hey, look, if you were going to leave this earth tomorrow and you could only leave behind your three best pieces of wisdom to the generations that come after you to help them live their best life, what would those three things be? So Rupal, what are your Misfit 3? Yeah, one is... It's okay to be weird. It's okay to be a misfit. It's okay to be different because, of course, the difference is where the ideas, the innovations, the breakthroughs come from. So don't force yourself to conform to industry best practice or, you know, whatever stuff that you feel forced to conform to. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be a misfit. Two, do it for all the people who can't. Because there are billions of people around the world and even probably people in your own family, in your own sort of past, right, who did not have the access, the privilege, the intellectual capabilities, the freedoms, the whatever, to be able to do the things that we have the luxuries to do and the choices we have the luxury of choosing between. So every time you get sort of stuck in that woe is me, like this is so hard, remind yourself that it's a real privilege and get over yourself and do it for all of the people who, who can't. <laughs> And then the last one I will share, and this we talked about briefly earlier, is my, I'm going to sort of offer my personal motto as, as, as one of these three is don't say no, never say no to an adventure. An adventure doesn't mean joining the CIA. It doesn't mean necessarily jumping out of a plane. But <sighs> adventure is about the mindset that you approach life. I view my marriage as an adventure. I view having kids as an adventure. I view being an entrepreneur as an adventure, in addition to, yes, jumping out of planes and being at the CIA. But 
say yes to adventure. You never know where it's going to take you. The things that you'll learn, not just about the world, but more fundamentally about yourself and what you are made of. And I think that is for me, one of the biggest uh, benefits of having this life, right? We get to see and do things that, you know, and, and see how it goes and see what we're made of before, you know, the, 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 our last breath. So have fun along the way and, and, and say yes to those adventures. Now oh, that's a excellent, excellent Misfit Three. All of those are so good. If um people do want to learn more about you, where should they go? The best place is my website, which is rupalypatel.com. Perfect. We'll link to that in the show notes, the best show notes in the business for reasons I will talk about more in a second. But first, for those of you that are new to the Misfit Entrepreneurs, your first episode with us, welcome. It is such an honor to have you with us. And I hope you become a regular listener, watcher, subscriber. And for all of you that are with us week in and week out, I cannot thank you enough for your support of the show. You are what makes this show go in over 100 countries every single week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And make sure and go out, check out the show notes for this episode. They are the best in the business. Why? Because I do them myself. As part of my just personal growth routines and improvement routines, I go back through these episodes every single week and I pick my best pieces of insight and habits and tips and tricks and things that I find from uh, great guests like Rupal and I share those with you. So go out and check those out. And then go out and give this episode a rating and review. Help share Rupal's message because I say this in every episode and we all know uh, one great episode can change someone's life. Maybe something that Rupal shared today was that missing link you were looking for to get to your next level. So go out and share this with others. And again, Rupal, thank you so much for coming on, sharing all your wisdom and insight today. Thank you so, so much for having me, David. It's been a real pleasure.